Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. This is the Broadband Bunch Zero Touch Learning Series, and we are live. Thanks so much for joining us today. I am Heather Gold, and today's session is entitled Strategic Considerations to Prepare for NTIA and Others New Broadband Funding. The Broadband Bunch podcast and Zero Touch Learning Series is brought to you as always by our Zero Touch Automation Experts at ETI Software and Utopia Fiber. Be sure to follow the Broadband Bunch on Facebook and Twitter. And you can access all the Broadband Bunch podcasts and webinars on your favorite podcast players and on the broadbandbunch.com. A quick reminder before we introduce our guests today. The session is definitely interactive. We encourage you to submit questions via the chat or question function, and our team will be monitoring them and playing them on to the, passing them on to the speaker. The session is also being recorded and will be available to all attendees for future access. Please free to submit potential topics for future Zero Touch Learning Series sessions or suggest prospective panelists. Thank you in advance for your participation. And I am pleased today to welcome Heather Mills, VP for Grant and Funding Strategies for CTC Technology and Energy, where she works to identify, strategize, apply for, and comply with the requirements of federal and state broadband funding opportunities. As the pandemic has critically demonstrated, each and every community is in desperate need of the best, fastest, and most interactive broadband available in order to ensure that its citizens have access to education, healthcare, and interconnection to the world. Most communities struggle to find the funding to deploy these networks, but fortunately, several federal and many state mechanisms are underway to assist in these efforts. Today, Heather Mills will touch on a variety of new federal funds that are set to become available soon and we'll touch on how to get situated now so that you are in a position to take advantage of them. Heather. Cool, thank you, Heather. Uh, welcome. I'm so pleased to be here today. That was an excellent introduction. Um, and I'm expecting, uh, Heather, that you'll have um, a couple of questions for me uh, uh, during the presentation. Feel free to interrupt yeah. me. That's great. <laughs> um, so really quick, our agenda today. Um, Heather covered this very well. We're gonna we're gonna say Heather a lot today, by the way. Um, I'm gonna go over a quick summary of terms in case some of you are unfamiliar with the uh, Washington speak, as I like to call it. Um, and then I'll do a, a rather fast overview of the new and upcoming federal funding opportunities. Uh, feel free to interject with questions, um, and uh, I'll give you some tools. Uh, to uh, sort of dive in in a few, a few other places to find information uh, about some of those programs. And then of course, we'll be reviewing our uh, strategic steps, uh, including you know, defining your project, coming up with the cost estimates and overview of the project, figuring out how you're gonna make that project happen and what you can be doing right now to get ready in general. So um, Heather. Yes. Sir. Can you take a minute just before we jump into the particulars and let us know how these funding opportunities arose and where we are with the big gorilla, RDOF? <laughs> so um, the CARES Act funding certainly has uh, been extended. Uh, I'm gonna refer to um, the second stimulus, which happened in December. I think it was signed into law December 27th. Uh, that is the meat of the NTIA pro programs, they're in there. Um, and then the ARPA, or uh, the most recent stimulus package uh, that was signed into law just about two months ago, uh, is where a good chunk of the rest of it is. And your second question in regards to RDOF, um, that uh, RDOF is the Rural Digital, Digital Opportunities Fund. And in particular, that program is a reverse auction, very similar to what was done with the Connect America Fund or CAP2, as I think some people will remember. 
Um, it is a two-stage process. The first stage was the uh, application or the short form application and the auction itself. And they're now in the middle of the long form application review of the winners of the auction. Um, and what that means is that we don't know if the if all of the winners will actually get funding because they have to get through that next step. Um, it's also left a, a little bit of a, we're unsure exactly how some of the funding programs will treat ARDOF in part because of the time in which it would take the uh, winners to implement their uh, strategies and in part because there is some concern over uh, how ARDOF uh, was the metrics and whatnot were put together uh, for making awards. And there's plenty of information and analysis about uh, the ARDOF auction. You can find it on our blog at ctcnet.us. Um, and uh, my colleague Ziggy Rivkin Fish has done a wonderful deep dive into uh, ARDOF in general. Did Thank that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Okay. So let's dive in. Um, this is Gromit, my French bulldog. Um, he looks at me like this whenever I say uh, words that, uh, that he likes, words like outside or eat. But I think of this expression whenever I, I say, whenever I'm having a casual conversation with friends and they ask me what I do, and I happen to say something like NOFO or ARPA, and they don't necessarily understand. So I wanted to make sure we set the tone in case there are people joining us today who haven't heard these uh, terms before. They're in no particular order on this slide. Um, you've already heard me say ARPA, uh, that's the American Rescue Plan Act, the most recent stimulus package that was passed into law. Uh, I think it was signed on March 11th. Uh, NTIA, the subject of uh, a lot of our interest today is uh, an administration uh, within the Department of Commerce, known as the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. This is the same organization um, that uh, uh, ran the BTOP program and um, several other broadband programs. Um, NOFO, Notice of Funding Opportunity. This is generally the thing that is put out uh, uh, by the various agencies when there is a program and it, it usually contains the, um, the rules and regulations uh, and directions for application for uh, the grant programs. RDOF, Rural Digital Opportunities Fund. We've already talked about this. It's a reverse auction um, uh, thing. We will come back to it a little bit more. I'll briefly talk about um, the EDA. They are also situated underneath the Department of Commerce. The Economic Development Administration uh, has a number of funding programs uh, as well, something that you guys might be interested in. We're gonna talk a little bit about some other funding programs. USAC is a, uh, uh, under the Wireline Competition Bureau at the FCC, uh, known as the Universal Service Administrative Company. They oversee universal service funding programs such as the Schools and Library Program, more commonly known as E-Rate. You'll also hear me refer to a program called Lifeline, um, and you'll hear me talk about the Emergency Broadband Benefit, which did not make this list. Um, maybe I'll revise that in the future. <laughs> and then finally, um, USDA, that's the Department of Agriculture. We'll be talking about a few of those programs there. Okay. So let's dive into NTIA. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about uh, these programs. I'll, I'll dive in a little bit as we get down further in the presentation. Um, but I wanted to give you the, the basics here. Um, and I'll start at the bottom and work my way up. Um, the Connect Minorities Pilot Program, obviously $285 million in the program. This is not an infrastructure program. This is to fund services, purchase equipment for minority serving institutions. So historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities, and to support the surrounding communities. So think of it as students needing to have access to internet off campus or close to campus. Then of course, there's a tribal broadband connectivity program, a billion dollars. When I hear that, it sounds like so much money but it's not enough money to solve the tribal broadband connectivity problem. It is enough money to make a good dent, to make a really good dent, a good start. Um, and this is infrastructure. 
and also making sure that um, everyone has access, wants access to online services in general. Um, what's nice about this program is there will be no match required for the grant. Um, and they are really doing a lovely job at NTIA of communicating with the stakeholders for this, this particular program and providing good guidance um, for what they can so far. Last but not least, the Promote Broadband Expansion Grant Program. I tend to refer to this as the partnership program, $300 million. And this is, of course, a focus on public-private partnerships and um, also a focus on rural projects. From the law, you can see that, that they don't rule out rural, um, sorry, urban projects, but there is a point system that they've put in place that gives rural projects uh, much more leverage in the application process. What's important to know about these two programs, the tribal program and the partnership program, is that they're looking for shovel-ready projects. Um, so the timeline is really going to matter for them. In particular, we expect a 90-day application window to open for both upon issuance of the Notice of Funding Opportunity. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna review responses as they get them, so that's a rolling application, and they'll get back to you if you put an application in within 90 days of receipt. And then once you've gotten an award decision, you have 180 days to start work. And once you've started work, you have a year to complete the work. This is the, this is the emphasis on shovel ready. Now you can ask for more time. Um, they understand that there are absolutely going to be roadblocks that come up from weather to permitting to pole replacement, they understand that. Um, it, so they're emphasizing uh, uh, communication uh, with, with your grant team at NTIA. Um, if you're concerned about finding a private partner in time, I would suggest uh, some quick strategies to think about. You can um, think about issuing a quick RFI or RFQ uh, or RFP, however your jurisdiction does it, that is really simple and focused and gets out there, you know, that you're interested in just having a conversation about a potential partnership. Um, the other option, of course, is to take a look at the RDOF maps or even the Reconnect awarded maps and see who got awards close or around your area that you might want to reach out to and see if they would be interested in coming further into you. So, Heather, that brings up another question, which mm -hmm. is, Will we know the outcome from this round of RDOF prior to the need to apply for these funds, or do we just have to assume the preliminary winners will be permanent? And then the follow-up to that is, are there any requirements not to double dip on these funds versus RDOF? So these are really great questions that I don't necessarily have. The second one I have an answer for, but the first one I don't necessarily have an answer for. And my guidance to clients has been have a plan A and a plan B. Um, plan for, I like to plan for the worst case scenario. Um, you might even, if your, you know, if your want is big enough, something that you could do in stages or a phased approach, a phase with and a phase without RDOF. Um, we, we are waiting for the rules for these programs to tell us how we're supposed to treat RDOF in the application process. And then Heather, um, repeat your other question for me. Um, are there were any requirements not to double dip? In other words, you can't have these funds and RDOF, and then we have a couple of follow-ups too. Okay. So um, what, the, what the law says is that you can use these funds as uh, in, in in congruence with another uh, grant program if it's allowed by the other grant program. But the law also says that you, that they are, um, they need to coordinate between the FCC and USDA for awarded areas. Um, so we need them to give us more clarity on exactly how that's supposed to come together. But I think it's safe to assume that double dipping is a no-no um, and you should, you know, plan to, leverage other funds as needed. Um, and we'll talk about what those other funds might be later on. So a couple of follow-ups from the audience. Mm -hmm. What maps are being used for the various funding programs and can the communities or the applicant get access to these maps? 
Um, we don't know yet. Um, we make we can make an assumption that um, they will at least rely a little bit on the 477 data, um, but we all um, are pretty much in agreement that uh, that's more of a trust but verify. That's certainly how USDA has treated it in the last couple of cycles with reconnect. Um, so we need the, we're waiting for the rules to tell us exactly how they're going to be doing that. And can the public get access to those maps or not? To the 477 data? Yes, yeah. that is available through the FCC. Okay, and then um, one last question. Is there a challenge process like there has been in, in FCC funding? So they haven't outlined that uh, uh, quite yet. I expect that to be part of the uh, notice of funding opportunity as well. Okay, but uh, one other question. So the NTIA funding is not subject to comment period like FCC programs. Correct. We expect them to uh, uh, release the the rules uh, in a note with the NOFO and open the application window at the same time. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So I want to make sure I talk at least a, a little bit more. Um, we've been sort of jokingly referring to this uh, the the money that's coming uh, as. Um, beautiful buckets of broadband bucks um, and uh, we're a bit delighted by it as well um, but I want to make sure I, I spend a little bit of time on on these other programs because this could really feed into your thinking and stra and strategies um, should you not have time to really leverage the NTIA program the way that you would like um, reconnect uh, with the December stimulus uh, that came through uh, was authorized um, and is now no longer a pilot program. They've just released the regulated rules for that program. We expect a NOFO to be released um, in the late fall, early winter, um, so probably December sometime, and um, expect that window to open up in late January, as with the previous two cycles. Um, and the window you can expect will be a 60-day window. The EDA has a lovely program called the Public Works and Economic Adjustment Assistance Program. Um, this program typically has, you know, between 130 and 150 million dollars a year allocated to it. They've got a great um, system where they've got regions and EDA representatives that you can contact, and and they'll help hold your hand as you figure out what you're applying for, and they'll give you guidance. That's really wonderful. Uh, but you also don't have a, uh, a deadline for those applications. This, with the ARPA law, they added $3 billion to the program, and that is after last year's, we call it the COVID amendment, where basically the entire country was, uh, was made somewhat eligible for the EDA program, the PWEAA program, uh, uh, and that program has an 80-20 split, so 20% uh, match is required. Um, $3 billion is a lot of money. They have a few years to allocate it. Uh, best time to submit generally for that program is uh, late September, early October, that you know previously aligned when, the, when they would get uh, new funds in. Um, my recommendation is that if you're interested in this program, um, it, it reach out to the EDA representative for your area and have a conversation. They are interested in broadband projects um, and they have funded a few in the last year and a half. Um, so it's a, it's a good option. On my mind, mostly today and yesterday, I, I lost a little sleep. Uh, the Treasury Department has just issued guidance on the state and local uh, funds that, that have already been sort of uh, sent off uh, uh, there. They've issued guidance on how to use those funds. But there's also another grant program, the Capital Projects uh, Grants, where there's $10 billion there. The rules, we're hoping to get those in the next few days. Um, I'm really expecting something, uh, I was hoping for something yesterday, <laughs> as well as the, the, the guidance that they gave elsewhere. But um, this is going to be a, a really good opportunity to fill in gaps as well. And you can expect that there would probably be a rural focus for, for this money uh, as well. And there'll be um, state level grants. So the states will propose to Treasury 
how to use the funds. And the okay. rules will will the rules be set by the state who gets the money or the Treasury Department? Excuse me. Um, the my understanding is the Treasury Department is going to issue rules, and the the states will then be required to um, propose the the use of the funds uh, from them. Okay. Okay. All right. Um. Last but not least, some honorable mentions. Um, these are not grant programs. Some of these are subsidies uh, programs, but I wanted to make sure that you are all aware of them. Uh, top of the list, of course, is the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. The consumer portal for the EBB opens tomorrow, as a matter of fact, and there's $3.2 billion in this fund. Um, and we don't know how quickly the take rate will be um, or how uh, I have high hopes that it'll be an easy onboarding process for those who are applying for the benefit. Um, and estimates uh, on how long that funding will last range from you know, five months to nine months. Um, of course, they have, I think, a worst case scenario uh, would be that they, um, they don't use all of the funds up and they close it up six months after the end of the pandemic is declared. Uh, but we'll have to see how that goes. Um, the emergency broadband benefit is also open. If you wanted to be a, a provider for that program, you do not have to be uh, what's known as an ETC. Uh, you can simply ask to um, uh, uh, be a provider and fill out a, uh, an application form and they'll qualify you for the program uh, to provide. It is built on what we call the lifeline program structure. Um, so the, the subsidy is paid directly to the provider by the uh, FCC or by USAC. Um, and the customers are, you know, get a credit on their bill essentially. Next up, of course, is the Emergency Connectivity Fund. I call this um, the addition, essentially additional E rate funds. Most E rate funds are all E rate funds generally come from the Universal Service Fund. So they are setting up a, a separate process to manage this. Um, and we have, I believe we have draft rules and expect final rules. Uh, I think they voted on them yesterday. Uh, $7.1 billion in that fund um, and very focused on making sure that uh, schools, uh, students have connectivity from wherever they are. And I touched briefly earlier on the state and local fiscal recovery funds, a total of $350 billion. Um, guidance released yesterday on the use of those funds, and that guidance did include that, that those funds could be used for broadband infrastructure. Um, take a close look at uh, how those rules come out. Um, we are issuing some analysis of that, I believe, later today, early tomorrow, so check out our blog for more information on those. And then last but not least is the Tribal Consistency Fund. I'm really excited about this. Uh, it's $500 million over two years, and the only restriction that's on this fund is that tribes cannot use it for lobbying purposes. So I have a question from the audience for you, Heather. Mm -hmm. So are all these funding programs available to all broadband providers, regardless of whether they are affiliated or not, with an ILEC or CLEC or neither? For example, can WISPAs or SpaceX pursue all these funding sources, just like during our RDOF? Interesting. Um, I think that that would apply to um, the emergency broadband benefit. You, you would, uh, you should certainly be able to um, to do that there. You have to apply to the FCC. They they did not limit it to just ETCs as they do with the Lifeline program. With the emergency connectivity fund, it's an E-rate process. So you have to um, apply to be an E-rate provider um, and go through the process there. Uh, uh, to um, get registered uh, with USAC as a provider. As far as the other funds, those, um, I don't think that question applies to the other two funds. Okay. Okay. So it's a question of being certified by your, by USAC or the FCC rather, rather than you have to be ETC necessarily. Correct. Okay. And keep in mind that these are all emergency programs as well. So they, they've um, made some, I believe, uh, exceptions or decisions around uh, uh, making those these 
more flexible uh, simply because they want to get to as many people as possible. Okay. So strategic steps that we recommend for any approach to a grant program, and I'll, I'll focus in on some of the NTIA pieces as we go through this. Um, we're going to talk about defining what your needs are, setting up and taking a close look at what it would take to meet those needs, and that's step two and step three, and then what you can do even right now to get started and be prepared for grant applications. So defining your needs is really, I think probably the most important piece of this. You generally have an idea uh, if you're a, a municipality or locality of where in your county or your city there is a desert uh, or there is a need for broadband. Um, take the time to really define that area. And keep in mind too that you may have a range of broadband needs. So make a list um, and you're going to want to find a way to target your proposal. Um, it, it is not advisable to, if you're a county, to say, well, I want money for the entire county. Um, generally, you're going to want to target your proposal and uh, create a narrative around that. And part of that narrative is absolutely uh, defining the community that's there, gathering information about um, the assets that you have already. So maybe you have conduit, maybe you already have some contracts in place that would make it easy for you to just jump into building if you need to. Um, there could be a number of uh, municipally owned buildings that you would like to have connected. Um, hospitals, schools, libraries, um, do they have any, any contracts in place? Uh, are there any contracts that might be a barrier to you doing any of this? And you got to think about who's going to lead the effort on your side. And once you've got a good idea of the area itself, you need to think about, well, other than the infrastructure that we know is there, you know, what is being offered there? You, so if you're going to, in your application, ask for money to build broadband, but there's already broadband there, you need to make a compelling argument as to why you're going to ask for money to build more broadband. So as you're doing that, you also need to think about, and I'll talk about this some more later on too, possible partners. You don't necessarily have to reach out immediately, but it is important for you to be making that list as well. Um, most important <laughs> to, to what, your, what your next steps are though, is going to be gathering support from anybody that will be affected in the area and from other stakeholders in your area. So um, reach out to the city council, reach out to the county council, reach out to your congressional leaders, get letters of support um, started because as soon as it's time to put the application in. It's almost too late to be asking for those. Um, so I have a question with respect to that. Yeah. When you're doing, I, and plus we have some audience follow up. Great. Uh, so my question is, should you have a community leadership champion program, not necessarily your partner, but some organization that's driving this? prior to starting and then how do you fund that collection that sort of support area and um, get it going so it doesn't hurt and i think that there might be a number of strategies you can employ and keep in mind that for some programs they will um, include for some grant programs you can include uh, the uh, application costs and you might be able to justify some of that here um, but most of the organizations that I work with either they appoint a project manager who it's just part of their job and it's um, sort of a in-kind if you will part of the grant process or they uh, lean on their economic development team to um, help uh, pull together the necessary uh, information that they need including letters of support so um, if you don't have that uh, 
a system set up, that structure set up, um, there that might make things a little bit harder. Um, but it also sort of puts an emphasis on starting to think about how to do that sooner rather than later. Great. And let me ask some of these audience questions. Um, first of all, I assume all this funding is domestic only. Correct. A foreign entity could not apply for this funding. I that is the first time I've gotten that question, um, but I think that's a uh, uh, accurate. And then, is there any funding for post build FTTH related to ma maintenance and troubleshooting of fiber networks? Um, are there any additional resources for broadband that can be issued after the initial build? So part of what you're doing when you're putting your application together, it's you're going to be putting together pro formas and those pro formas should absolutely take into account um, and it will depend on the grant program how long they ask for it, but maintenance and operations for an extended period of time. Generally, I see that um, request uh, as part of the application materials for up to five years. Um, and what they're looking for is that you're not losing money at the end of five years. Um, and hopefully by then you would have also implemented other means of continuing on, or you've structured your business plan in such a way that the system starts to help pay for itself. Okay. And then are there programs weighted by different technologies um, that are used to deliver the services and are latency service weighted differently than high latency services? So that's gonna depend on the program. Um, and some programs will uh, favor um, fiber. Uh, some will uh, be agnostic uh, simply because they want to get service out as quickly as possible. Um, so you'll need to look at the rules in the program to make sure. And I haven't seen specifically uh, rules in any program about uh, latency, around latency itself, um, but it wouldn't surprise me if it somehow creeps up in the next few, few years. And Heather, are there any middle mile applications to this funding or is it just last mile? Um, yes, there are middle, middle mile applications to uh, some of the funding options here. Um, you'll again, we'll, we're waiting for final rules on the newer programs for that in, that in particular. Um, but these programs specifically are emergency programs meant to connect people. And they're probably, uh, when we see the rules, going to be weighted heavier towards last mile. Okay. And one final question in this group. Using 477 data for determining existing coverage is well known to be insufficient. That's a very okay. polite way to say that. Yeah. With the use of census blocks to determine coverage, are there strategic ways to determine soft spots that aren't covered? Um, so one of the things that we're starting to see is, and, and they did this with the reconnect program. Um, they didn't rely on the 477 data. It was more of a, you know, guidebook, if you will. Um, and you are able to, with the application tool there, um, uh, draw an amorphous blob and cut out the areas that didn't apply to your project, maybe because they were well served, but you're getting, you know, around that area. My hope is that uh, more programs will adopt that structure um, and uh, that they will that will then give time to uh, the powers that be to fix their mapping problem. <laughs> We're hopeful. We're hopeful. <laughs> and, and that is all the questions for now. Okay, great. All right. So let me see. And I know I made this point a little bit earlier, um, but uh, definitely take the time to do the homework and the due diligence on the existing funding that's out there for your area. Even if it's just, even if you know there isn't an existing funding right in your area, the, the surrounding area may matter and it may help you define your project a little bit more. And as I said earlier, RDOF should absolutely be a factor in your evaluation and I would have a plan B in case you're not able to build in those areas. All right, in step two, we're talking about technical analysis and cost estimates. What I mean by technical analysis is really um, the high level engineering that would lead to a cost estimate. Um, so 
you need to outline what you need to build in your project area to meet your defined needs from a technical perspective. And that really means that high level dive into the proposed routing of the infrastructure and a good understanding of the equipment that you need to make it work. And it also means taking a really close look, sharpening that pencil about what it would take to build it, to operate it, to maintain it. And that this is where you are going to start building your pro forma for this project. And as an aside, the reconnect program, when you're applying to reconnect and you're putting in your pro forma information, you actually have to provide pro formas for your entire operation, not just the project itself. So be prepared for that eventuality. Um, that, uh, that can be a little bit challenging uh, for uh, uh, smaller operations if you're just focusing on one small area. So, um, sorry, one second. For the NTIA programs, you're gonna to wanna to be as shovel ready as possible for your application, as I said over and over again. Um, and for the Reconnect and EDA applications, those you can really start with a conceptual high level estimate for your application um, because the engineering costs are sort of built into the grant application process. So again, the, the major difference I see there is for NTIA, you're gonna wanna come as ready as possible. You won't have a lot of time to complete engineering after the award because you need to be implementing your project as soon as possible. Be as precise as possible with your cost estimate and be ready to include um, narrative. Uh, what always helps me is when I get a cost estimate that then gives me a quick bulleted breakdown of the assumptions that went into it. Um, and that way, when your team is putting together the budget narrative that's most definitely gonna be required, it's that much easier for them to sharpen their pencils and write a great narrative for the application. The sooner you start, the better off you'll be. Um, I find the technical piece, the cost estimate piece, is the key to really getting the application together. Um, and you can always make adjustments as you go, um, but it's also going to feed into other things too, such as the timeline. Um, and I have a sample timeline that I'll show you in just a second, but I do want to say that even if you're not able to meet the NTIA timeline of a year and or even two years, um, I don't think any efforts that you expend as you're thinking about this are a waste because there are these other programs that you might be able to apply to. And these are the steps that you would take to do general strategic broadband planning anyway. So none of that work is gonna go to waste, even if it's the, the brainstorm of a future like great idea. Um, in the timeline, I've put together here a, a sample. We have a oh, couple sorry. of questions. Sorry. sorry go ahead. <laughs> um, are there any, oh, this is music to consultancies. Are there any specialist consultancies which will build the case and make the application for you? Uh, yes, <laughs> there certainly are. Um, uh, CTC certainly does that work. There are other consultancies that does that does that kind of work um, uh, as well. Uh, you can um, put out an RFP if you um, have time uh, to do that uh, to find an engineer. You can uh, certainly look at if you're if your organization has an engineer of record, they might be able to help you as well. And that that's the follow-up. What kind of technical expertise do you need here? And what kind of costs are built and are any of them recoverable? Okay. Um, so again, that would be dependent on the rules uh, as far as recoverable costs. Um, you'll, you would want to keep track of your time and effort in doing this. Um, but the type of costs that you're looking at are things like um, whew, uh, co construction costs, engineering costs. You need uh, the specialist that you really need is an outside plant engineer and a network engineer. Um, uh, uh, I think that's uh, that's generally it. But you also want to be thinking about what equipment is going to be needed, um, how many how many staff people will be needed, uh, who's doing the maintenance, what does it cost to do the maintenance. Um, if your if your project is going to be underground, what are the average costs for that? Uh, 
uh, did you build in um, costs to around uh, environmental compliance if needed? Um, make ready uh, for for aerial uh, what that might cost on the low end and on the high end. Just having a good understanding of of even just that brief list is going to be helpful uh, overall. Great. All right. Okay. Um, Sample timeline. My advice to anybody putting together a grant application is that they they use Excel has a great tool. I did this in Excel. It'll create this for you. You just have to, you know, tell it when to start and when to end, um, and it fills this out. It's a good visual to include in your grant application. Um, it helps to show that you've thought through the process and that you know what you're talking about. My my sample list here. Some of this would may not apply. Um, to what you're looking at, and I took what is typically a, a three-year plan and crunched it down into one to give you an example. And you know, uh, in general, uh, what I did here was I, I sort of smushed together fiber construction and QAQC to show that you could sort of start fiber construction and do the QAQC at the same time. But um, really, you should be planning, you know, and uh, to do something visual with milestones to include in your uh, application. And be prepared to talk about what goes into each of these you know, activities in general, uh, just so that they know that you've thought it through um, and uh, that you're serious about it. What happens if you're granted the funds and you don't, and the timeline isn't met? What are the ramifications of that? So you'll be doing regular reporting and touch points with the, with the agency that's done the grant for you. And um, uh, there, there can be adjustments made um, as you go. Um, and you, with the NTIA programs, you have up to a year extension for the program. Uh, so just be aware of that. And my advice overall is don't bite off more than you think you can chew. Um, if you only have a year to do something, don't plan to do a thousand miles of fiber. Um, it, you know, be realistic about what you're asking for. And it really does need to fit the, the goals of the program itself. So take a close look at what those things are as they in the various programs as they come out with rules. Okay. All right. So step three, you know, previously I had uh, mentioned, you know, uh, building partnerships and, and um, getting started thinking about that. Part of, a major part of your application is your business strategy. And um, NTIA is gonna be looking for applicants that can really demonstrate that they've got one and that it's a strong business strategy. They want to award funds to financially viable programs. So your application really needs to make the case that you are investment ready. So in other words, that NTIA should invest in your project and that your project is not going to die after uh, two years uh, in the in the field. Um, I talk about pro formas earlier and being ready to explain your business uh, your business plan in a budget narrative. Um, that is also going to uh, include things like what are your overall per passing costs for FTTH, and do you have take rate assumptions uh, in there? And you should um, uh, so that you can show uh, the sustainability of your program. If you don't have experience operating your own network, partnership with an established provider is a way to demonstrate operational capabilities. Um, so you can put out an RFI or an RFP to get interest. Um, and again, NTIA is specifically looking for a public-private partnership for the partnership program. The tribal program, you can have a partner. Um, they will allow sub-grantees. Um, you have to talk with them about what that would look like. The other thing too about uh, public-private partnerships is it's a really great way for local, state, and tribal organizations to achieve broadband goals while overall reducing financial risk. So, but keep in mind that grant programs are fundamentally designed to deliver limited funds where they will do the most good. So that's just reinforcing what I said earlier. Don't bite off more than you can chew and plan. Um, and really take the time to think about who's gonna do the work uh, in your organization and make sure you draw a picture in your business strategy. Maybe it's a, 
uh, organizational chart and explain who's doing what and what their current role is and how that role fits into uh, the overall project. And I talked a little bit earlier about financial match requirements. We don't know what the match is going to be required for uh, the partnership program. Um, if I had to guess, I would say somewhere between uh, uh, 60 and 80 percent, so um, sorry, 40 and 20 percent. Um, but we do know that the tribal program has no match required. I'm very excited about that piece of it. Uh, Heather, are there any questions about the, the, the yes. this strategy? I have a couple. Um, who is then the primary filer? Is it the community? And then you've touched on this before the ETC requirements that I guess will vary by fund. Yeah, that would vary by fund. Um, uh, for the NTIA programs, for the tribal program, it would be that the tribal organization would be the main applicant. And what I understand is that they will allow sub applicants or partners in the tribal program. Um, and that means that the partner would have to also fill out the uh, appropriate forms uh, in there. Um, for the partnership program, I, I don't want to say one or the other because I need for them to define who the applicant is, but I imagine that it would be an equal, uh, both the, uh, the partner, the private partner, and the, um, the municipality uh, uh, would, would be equal applicants. So they're both going to have to fill out the paperwork. Okay. Okay. And then um, the question, what, ooh, wait a minute. Stakeholder management, muni, county, state, utility roads, parks, infrastructure owners, what is their ability to digest and support my project on the required timeline? I think that would depend on the organization itself. Um, you would wanna, as part of step one, reach out to them as soon as possible and uh, uh, talk with them and work with them to make sure that, that they can support you in the project um, as, as part of a very first step. And then can other um, federal funds, oh, the first question is, what percentage match is required for the NTI promote broadband expansion grant program? They and what defined. is the bigger Sorry. pardon? They haven't defined that yet. We're waiting okay. for the rules. And is the public partner expected to contribute? Um, I do not know the answer to that question. Um, I, I imagine that the um, it, it, that's part of the business strategy that you need to work out um, with them. And again, I would have a plan A and a plan B. Um, I know that I said that before in relation to RDOF, but you may want to um, uh, think 360 around what those options are. Um, and in choosing a partner, uh, what you're capable of doing is it important. And I believe that you are able to use, um, you know, uh, funds that are part of the ARPA um, state and local uh, funds to um, uh, uh, help here. Um, that it, I believe that's permitted. Um, so take a close look at, at, at those. So the ARPA funds can be used as the matching funds. I believe that they that they could be used as the matching funds. We just got the rules and we're doing an analysis. So um, I didn't see a strict restriction against that. It is a question that I have um, asked NTIA and hadn't gotten an answer for either. So it's that I've asked that question and the art off question and they they demurred and did not answer. So my advice is to wait for the rules to get a final answer there. Okay. No other questions at this time. Okay, great. Um, so last but not least, um, step four is really more of something you, it, it's not following all those things. If you're planning to do any kind of a grant application, you can be doing these things pretty much immediately. Um, the, the first being making sure that you are set up in the grants.gov and sam.gov uh, online systems. Sam.gov is basically the vendor portal for the federal government. Um, when you sign up there, they will give you a unique identifier called a cage code um, that uh, then gets fed into the grants.gov platform. You really do want to take some time to get familiar with these um, systems. Grants.gov can be um, uh, fun to navigate, 
uh, well, not fun to navigate. It can be a little bit confusing. It is not entirely user-friendly. Um, and you'll need to set up an administrator and users, and you'll need to understand how workspaces work uh, at the uh, on the site for making the applications. Um, and this goes for ISPs um, interested in the partnership program as well. You should absolutely have a SAM.gov and a Grants.gov account set up so that it's easy. Don't wait to do this until the application portal opens. Do it right now. Um, and it'll, it's something that is pretty much universal for most of the federal funding programs. Um, I, will, I will note the USDA programs, those grant programs, usually you're, you're using the USDA grant portal. Um, so that also takes time. You have to um, go through and get a second level e-authentication with uh, the USDA portal. Um, so plan around it and give, give them time as well. This, these are very popular sites these days. Um, you'll want to make sure that you have uh, the administrative capacity to get done what needs to get done there. And you will need to provide things like your DUNS number and your uh, tax identification number uh, for those accounts. We mentioned earlier the in step one that you should start thinking about as you're looking at your area, your project area, that you're going to want to really dive into the demographics of the area. Um, Make sure that you're in touch with your economic development team if you have one. They might be able to, that might be something of an easy button to get information uh, for you, but uh, make sure that you're uh, doing a good job of getting the most up-to-date information about the demographics of the area and about the um, other services offered in the area as well. And then make sure you take some time as you're getting those letters of support about other supporting materials that might matter to your application. Maybe you did a feasibility study a year or two ago, and that is something that you would wanna reference in your application as this has been a long-term goal, and this is part of how we're going to get there. That kind of discussion is important. Is there anything else that you can think of as well that would help your application in there? Uh, definitely include that in your um, list of things to get done and gathered. The easier, or sorry, the sooner you have that gathered, the easier it will be when you go to get your application together. And then I have to say and give really good reviews and props to NTIA um, and uh, the FCC USAC for the work they've been doing to give guidance um, for the, the new emergency programs. They really have done a good job take the time to go watch the webinars, look at the materials. They're good about posting the slides the next day, or if not sooner. And they're pretty good about answering questions as soon as they get them. Um, the webinars tend to be a bit crowded, um, but they always post the recordings. Um, and I know that NTIA, I think they may have postponed the rest of the May uh, webinars, but those were repeats of ones they'd already done. Um, and I know that they'll be doing several more in June and July. Um, um, we have more questions. Sure. <laughs> other than this, other than this fact-filled webinar, where is the most reliable place to review the program parameters until the rules are released? Is there anything written out, or is it just the NTIA webinar series? Um, yeah, I'm going to refer you to their website to get the most up-to-date information. Um, if you're really nerdy like me, um, you subscribe to the Federal Register alerts, and I, I uh, have found myself putting myself to sleep at night reading uh, uh, the Federal Register, but I it simmers when I'm sleeping, I find. Um, I, I have a little broadband alert, so anytime broadband comes up in the Federal Register, I get a little notice. Um, and it's it's worth the time if you're if you're nerdy like me, but their website is the best place to get the most up to date information. Um, and then here is my understanding is the RDOF did not fund in Alaska due to the Alaska plan. I have heard concerns that applicants have indeed overreached for accomplishing their goals for the grant. It sounds like NTA is trying to have more oversight than that. That being said, are these programs expected to have requirements for download upload speeds? Yes. Okay. Yes. 
and pay attention to and uh, it, I think it's something of a moving target um, and the reason my answer is so short is in part because uh, some of the programs will uh, uh, require uh, 25 3 as the sort of starting point and there are some programs out there where uh, 25 3 is considered unserved or underserved and they want more so you need to look at each program to see uh, what the uh, speed requirements are for the threshold for eligibility of the area and you need to pay attention to the requirements of the program for ultimately what you're installing or proposing to install some will require that you so for example um, unserved or eligible areas maybe anything 25 3 and less but if that doesn't mean that you are going to be installing 25.3. That means that the program may require you to, to install 100 symmetrical. So be aware of those varying requirements. And, and Heather, don't we anticipate that under the new administration, there will be a change in the speed requirements anyway? Um, I can't speak to that. I don't oh. know. I, ho I, I hope so. There's been discussion about it anyway. I so, <laughs> um, I, I think too, like um, it, for any of these applications, um, uh, as an aside, it's it's really smart to go above and beyond with um, not only your uh, letters of support, but um, taking the time to do the the thinking uh, around how you're going to be delivering service um, in there. So, okay. Any other questions, Heather? Not right the second. Okay, so a quick overview. Um, we've talked about defining your needs, developing that um, uh, technical analysis and the costs that go with it, the, the high level engineering and equipment needed, um, thinking through your business strategy, how that's gonna come together, and then of course getting started with the basics. Um, so that is, all of it and Ramit thanks you. Um, he's not entirely asleep, but mostly. Any other questions, Heather? Hello? I think we lost Heather Gold. I think we lost Heather Gold. I'm sorry. She she um she must have had some technical difficulties. But um, in conclusion, we'd like to thank everyone for attending, um, and to thank Heather Mills especially for her time today, and to let you know that there will be a recording made available to all participants. Um, so look for a follow up email um, in your inbox shortly. Thanks so much, Heather, and thank you all for uh, for joining today. Thank you.